everybody get a full glass? We got one over here. No, 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 no they're bringing. And we need a glass over here. No, they're bringing some rosé. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Wow. Hi everybody. My name is David Berger. I'm the publisher of Real Clear Politics, and on behalf of Real Clear Politics and Counter Books and the Claremont Review of Books, and also the Colony Club. I mean, it's, it's such a wonderful opportunity to kind of get back to thinking. And if someone who's moved down from New York five years ago with my wife Fabiana. It's like I spent most of those years in PBI Airport, actually going to. New York, Washington, D.C., California, or somewhere else. And one of the things about staying home this year is that you realize how open California is. I've got open California. <laughs> <laughs> how open Florida is. I mean, and it's like. <laughs> no, I, and I do think it's a testament to, you know, kind of. You know our governor, but also the state that you know it's open for business, and, and I'd like to thank you know, the Colony Club for really kind of providing us the venue tonight in order to have these conversations. And my goal now is I want to travel less. So what I'd like to do is have instead of me flying to D.C. and Washington and New York all the time, I'd like for people from D.C., Washington, and California <laughs> to come down to Palm Beach because Amen. this is a place where we can have a, a free and fun conversation. Yeah. This is a particular pleasure for me um, because it's, it's very rare that you have the opportunity to kind of just celebrate ideas with friends. Um, you know, this is particularly interesting pairing because it's like my favorite publisher, uh, you know, Roger Kimball and Encounter Books, and my favorite book reviewer, Charles Kessel and the Claremont Review of Books, have joined forces uh, in order to publish Charles. And I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Roger, who will introduce Charles. But uh, I think if you want to understand what connects Claremont and uh, Encounter Books is that it's an abiding concern for the kind of, you know, this country that we have, this thing that's been bequeathed to us. Uh, everybody is, uh, likes to quote uh, Franklin's admonition when he was coming out of the Constitutional Convention that says, you know, what do you give us? A republic if you can keep it. I think if you ask both sides of the aisle, uh, whether they be, you know, Republican or Democrat, you know, uh, you know, woke or Quanon, whatever it is, everybody would agree that this republic is in a crisis. And I think that one of the things that Encounter Books and the Claremont Institute, the CRB, have a real concern for is actually figuring out how to actually think through that crisis and. In a responsible way. So I would tell everyone before you leave that you can get a copy of the greatest uh, book review out there, except when other books are being reviewed in the new criterion, which uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ryan is the publisher of. <laughs> you have to. It's business. It's business. And also, there's there's copies of uh, Charles's fine uh, book, but if I, if, if I have to introduce Roger, so it's like this. And it's not a short run, I promise you. Um, but it's, you know, if you looked at the founders, I like we were just talking about Franklin, uh, one of the things that I think uh, character, characterizes Roger is that he has, he has about three or four of the founders in him in some respects. I mean, he's like Franklin, and then he's got his publishing house. Right? And he's also like Thomas Paine, if you've ever read some of his uh, articles, or, or, well, many of his articles, because I think he publishes. Uh, probably three times a week, at least prior to you know, during the election he was. And he, he, he really is a Paul Revere in the sense, if you look through the catalog of uh, Encounter Books, you'll see some of the best people in this country asking and answering the biggest questions of our day. And I think we're here today because this great intellectual stock picker saw in, in Charles what is in Charles, and he's asked him to write a book. Charles, you, you, you didn't ask me to write a book. You probably had this book in you. <laughs> and, uh, and we're here to hear from it. But uh, thank you, uh, Encounter. Roger, I'll give it over to you. Thanks. Thank you, David. Well, <clears throat> um, 
I will follow the advice that the priest who W.H. Auden talks about gave to um, someone who came to him for confession. He said, uh, be brief, to be blunt, and be gone. <laughs> so, in, in brief, um, I, I, I do believe that uh, Charles Kessler in, in this book, The Crisis of the Two Constitutions, has written one of the most important books that we will see this season. Why do I say that? What is the crisis of the two constitutions? What are the two constitutions? Well, we have the constitution that was bequeathed to us by the founders, by James Madison and his colleagues. This was a document that was designed principally to be a kind of prophylactic, to protect individual liberty from the coercive power of the state. What is the other constitution? That is the living constitution propounded by people like Woodrow Wilson. This is the constitution that actually is the annulment of the founder's constitution and that has bequeathed to us what we now call the administrative state, the deep state. What is that? Well, that is what Woodrow Wilson's great insight of the people around him was that, you know, we have expanded the franchise, and now the voters are doing things that we, the experts, don't like. How can we subvert and circumvent the voters' will? They came up with a brilliant idea. We will hand the real power, we will locate the real power of this government in the administrative apparatus. And therefore, you know, our lives, if you want a license for X, Y, or Z, you have to go to some bureaucrat who you didn't elect, who you can't get rid of, and yet he has absolute power over your lives. Just, I mean, you know, this has been true for quite some time, but in the, the age of COVID, when people are quivering under their beds uh, at the prospect of what is, after all, a seasonal respiratory virus that is uh, serious for only a very tiny part of the population, you realize what's happened is they've pulled the, uh, you know, while we are all masked, they have pulled the mask uh, of deception off the government uh, uh, bureaucrats who run our lives, who tell us, you know, where we can go, wh whether we can eat in a restaurant. Uh, uh, the idea that it was somehow uh, for public health and that they were following the science uh, is laughable. It's all, all you have to do to understand that is trace the statements of St. Anthony Fauci from last March <laughs> till, till today. Well, well, this book is an anatomy, uh, both it explains what the Founders Constitution was, what the Progressive Constitution is, and why, uh, why it is important to stand against the Progressive uh, uh, interpretation of the or subversion of the Constitution and embrace the founders. Now, um, Charles Kessler is an ostentatiously eminent commentator on uh, uh, the political situation and um, uh, the history of the Constitution. One of the things that David did not mention is that among his many books, among, in, in addition to his editorship of the Claremont Review and his teaching, is that he was a member of the President's 1776 Commission. This was a commission deliberately aimed at uh, refuting the anti-American and tendentious claims of this, the New York Times' 1619 <coughs> project, whose fundamental ideas were that A, America was founded as a slaveocracy, and B, that the American Revolution was fought in order to perpetuate the institution of slavery. It's a, it's a terrible colony on what, uh, what this country was all about. And um, I, I, I'm proud to say that although uh, the Biden administration in one of its very first acts, uh, this, this report was published on Martin Luther King Day, January 18th. The Biden administration took office at noon on January 20th, within hours. The 1776 report was taken down, canceled, sent into the existential oubliette of cancel culture, 
and uh, we thought maybe it would never see the light of day. I'm happy to say that Encounter Books has just, as I speak, is publishing a, um, a, a, a version of, well, it's publishing the whole 1776 report with a new preface by Larry Arne, the chairman of the commission, and copious notes and citations and so on. It's, uh, uh, I, I like to think of these two books going together because they justify, uh, if not uh, God's ways to man, then at least uh, what makes us such a great republic. Charles Kessler. <laughs> Very much, uh, Roger. It's uh, it's great to be here, and I appreciate my old friend David DeRosier, who's helped to organize this uh, wonderful event. Um, and I'm appreciative, of course, also of my other host, uh, Roger Kemble, who is the um, greatest <coughs> conservative uh, publisher in the United States uh, today and the, the editor of the greatest conservative cultural journal in the country today, The New Criterion. Uh, but you would uh, not lessen but increase the accuracy of both of those statements if you struck the, world, the word conservative from them. Um, this is the greatest publishing house, I think, in the country. Just look at the authors it's publishing, look at the public service it is doing by publishing the 1776 Commission Report. Um, I like to say the 1776 Commission was the most efficient government commission in the history of government commissions. <laughs> I, 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 this is literally true. I, it, as he said, we published the report on Monday. On Tuesday, I received in the mail my embossed presidential scroll. You know, if, you, if you're <laughs> appointed to any of these things, you get a, the only real the tangible payoff you get is um, a, uh, a big scroll that uh, you have to uh, pay, of course, to have framed. <laughs> and, and it does have what seems to be the president's signature on it. I received that uh, Tuesday afternoon. By Wednesday, um, or uh, rather Monday, I think, afternoon, by January the 20th, the, uh, the inauguration day, by the afternoon of January the 20th, I was canceled. The commission was abolished. Uh, so I, I was a, the official, uh, truly officially a member for about 18 hours, I think, wow. of, this, uh, of this commission. But we did, we did a hell of a job <laughs> in, uh, in, in a very uh, few weeks. And of course, Joe Biden could have taken a different uh, attitude towards it. He might have. Um, added a few of his own members to it, continued it as a bipartisan effort, nothing of the sort. It was one of the very first executive orders that he signed abolishing this commission designed to defend the integrity of the American founding of 1776. I mean, you, normally you don't think that American politics is about um, impugning 1776, about trying to cancel the founding itself. But that really is what our politics has now um, become. If you think back over just uh, the last uh, month or two of what has been going on, or extend that maybe further, six months or so, as the pandemic took hold in the United States, we also had a pandemic of statues being damaged, defaced, destroyed. And not just the statues of Confederate generals or slave-holding founding fathers, not that there was any justification for either of those actions, but I'm talking about the statues of Abraham Lincoln, of Frederick Douglass, a, an ex-slave and leading abolitionist orator, of Abigail Adams, who the last time I checked identified as a woman. <laughs> In other words, they were destroying, they were not destroying as it were the usual suspects. They were not destroying the, the usual political opponents of liberal or progressive rhetoric. They were striking at Washington, Jefferson, uh, Lincoln. They were striking at the icons of Americanism. 
Just recently in San Francisco, I'm sure you've read, that 44 <coughs> public schools, the school board, voted to, to strike the names from 44 public schools in the, uh, in the city of, and county of San Francisco. And so, again, the usual suspects, in some respects, Lincoln, Washington, Jefferson, those names were going to be replaced, but also Diane Feinstein. <laughs> now, um, I thought you had to be dead <laughs> to have a public school named after you. That used to be the old rule. Do you know something about Diane Feinstein that I don't know? <laughs> Is, is there a Joe Biden elementary school <laughs> somewhere in San Francisco? Um, but, you know, as, as strange as it is uh, to be naming elementary schools after living politicians, it's apparently um, uh, par for the course in San Francisco. But they stopped, they paused, to be more precise, they paused this motion for renaming schools because all of the schools they were going to rename this being California, were of course closed. So, so the, in, a, in a principal decision, the school board decided we would reopen them before we rename them. But of course, they're still not reopened and there's no prospect that they will be reopened anytime soon because even though the governor of California is in, all in favor of this, uh, the teachers union is all against this and they would prefer a an, an elong elongated paid vacation <laughs> to actually going back into the classroom uh, and teaching. But these are not the only kinds of things, anomalous things in many ways that are happening in American politics. Let's think back just to the uh, events of, at the very end of 2020. Um, you may recall that um, the former president of the United States, Donald Trump, for whom about 75 million Americans voted, is still banned from Twitter. Uh, he is off those particular airwaves, as it were. And the whole point of the second impeachment of President Trump, who's, who lives not far from here right now, was not to impeach him since he had already left office. So there, technically there was nothing to impeach him for because he was no longer the President of the United States, who is the person the Constitution refers to as being liable for impeachment. What they wanted to do was to use impeachment as a way to get to disqualification. Disqualification is also mentioned in the Constitution. Disqualification means if the Senate decides to, after they impeach someone, they can also prevent him from ever running for public office again. That was the object of the impeachment. It was not to impeach him, he was already, he was out the door. What they wanted was to prevent him from ever running for president or for any other high office again. So what we're really talking about is something which the ancient Greeks called ostracism, the ancient Romans called proscription. Um, and they were very serious about it. If you were ostracized in Athens, you were expelled for 10 years. You could not return to the city in 10 years. Your property, uh, in most cases, was confiscated by the city and given to your political enemies. It was even deadlier in Rome. Uh, in Rome, if you were proscribed, that meant your name went on a list. And Anyone could kill you in the name of the public. And not, not only that, but they would receive as a reward for killing you your property or a share of your property. So they had an additional incentive to do so. Now, neither ostracism nor proscription is in the US Constitution. But in, in this instance, in a very strange turn of events, we saw the <clears throat> the liberals, the progressives in America, using the written constitution, using the founders' constitution, um, as we were, you were just hearing about, to create a new provision in the progressives, 
Constitution. We're using the Founders Constitution to create a new provision, as it were, in our, in our common law constitution, our common law liberal constitution, how we govern ourselves now, which was designed for the first time in American history to allow Congress to strike people from the public roles, from the, to prevent them from ever running for president, in this case, again, because they were too popular. They might win again. The whole argument is only works if you fear that this person might run again and win again. So here's an, an ominous example of using the Founders Constitution to do something completely contrary to the Founders Constitution, impeachment for the sake of ostracism or prescription. And one last ominous recent development I want to mention uh, has to do with the elections. Have you noticed that, you know, it used to be said that <clears throat> as long as we agreed about the nature of personal liberty and elections, the other political differences in America didn't matter that much. We agreed on the fundamentals. But I think what the 2020 election proved is that we no longer agree about personal liberty and elections. So what is it that we do agree on as one people, as a country? That's what this book asks. Um, in particular, there is now a disagreement in principle, I think, which has become obvious between the Republicans and the Democrats, between the conservatives, the followers of the original Constitution, and the progressive critics of that Constitution. Um, I think it's pretty obvious now that Republicans, <clears throat> by and large, think that an election is about individual voters who show up in some common forum or format and cast an actual vote. And that vote can be for any candidate, for any propositions, for uh, any measures, it doesn't really matter. It's your vote, you may cast it as you rationally or otherwise wish to cast it. Liberals increasingly, however, think of elections as something very different. They think of elections not as the gathering of individual votes deliberated in the head of each voter, but gathering the groups, the blocks of voters that make up the body politic whether they are divided by race, or by class, or by gender, or by sexuality, or, how, or, or by occupation, however you want to divide them, these, the, the, real, the, the real votes to be gathered, to be measured, are not individual votes. The individuals are voting as proxies for the group to which they belong. And, there, and therefore, these votes can be harvested to use this amazing new term. They can be harvested, that is, you can leave them anonymously in a Dropbox someplace without any verification of, you know, that you are the actual person who signed the vote and put it there. Um, you may have someone from a political party or another interest group come and gather votes and turn them in, in block uh, to the registrar. And that's because group votes have to be made effective. You know, we don't want to lessen the power of the group by canceling votes, um, uh, the ballots of which have not been signed correctly, or have been misdated, or have been mailed and they got in, you know, after the election was over. All of these things which used to be regarded as simple violations of the code are now injustices. They are attempts to dilute the vote of the group or the block. The vote of the block must be made effective, and that means any irregularities in individual voting must be tolerated in order to make the group vote effective. This all comes really out of the Voting Rights Act and the torrent of litigation that started in 1965 over how to interpret that Voting Rights Act. So these are examples of how strange how parlous our political life is today. These are not disputes along the usual political or ideological lines. Uh, something more profound and more dangerous is going on. 
a, there's a kind of revolutionary impulse at work, pulling down statues of Frederick Douglass, of Abraham Lincoln, of George Washington, exposing heretics to public ridicule, silencing dissenters. You know, in a recent poll taken by the Cato Institute, and, and admittedly, this is one of your more excitable think tanks, <laughs> but still, uh, <clears throat> they found that 62% of Americans said that they are afraid to voice their political views for fear of retaliation, public retaliation of some kind. 62% of Americans are afraid to express their political views. That's why I call this book The Crisis of the Two Constitutions. You know, it used to be thought that the liberal and the conservative constitution, these were just ways of interpreting the written document. You had a, a more loose, sort of liberal way of interpreting it. You had a stricter, more conservative way of interpreting interpreting it. But believe me, that is not the case anymore. That was the, the 19th century division of parties could be described in that way. But we're now talking about two alternative constitutions that are battling it out. Two visions of America, two contrary accounts of what constitutes American civilization, American, the American nation, American citizenship. It doesn't look like a revolution in many respects, I admit that. Um, when we think of revolution, we think of you know, drastic change, change all at once. A, a sudden stasis, a sudden uh, violent crisis, like something like we think of, I guess, the French Revolution. This is a different kind of revolution, but very much a revolution nonetheless. It's hard to grasp because it is so different from our image of what a revolution is. This is a rolling revolution. That really has been going on for a hundred years in American politics. That spread in three giant waves across the 20th century and already drastically changed American life and American government. These three waves which the book talks about began with the progressive era, um, Woodrow Wilson, who was already acknowledged uh, uh, this evening, and then the New Deal, and then of course the 1960s, the revolution of the 1960s. Each of these waves changed our expectations of American politics. And I think it's very important for us to realize it is difficult, it's going to be difficult to reverse these waves because they have had a hundred years in which to work their destruction in American politics. Our Constitution, the original, the only real Constitution, the, the, the Founders' Constitution, has been under assault already for a century, and has been, in some ways, already uh, drastically changed. Therefore, it's not, it, you know, one president, cannot make a difference. One Supreme Court cannot make a difference. This is a long-term effort, both to understand what's happened to us and to begin to reverse what has happened to us. Um, a revolution like this isn't really, it doesn't require, it may issue finally in something violent, a true upheaval in society. But John Adams, for example, um, made a distinction which I think is very relevant to us between what he called the American Revolution and the War of Independence. The War of Independence is what we all think of as the, you know, the famous events, Washington crossing the Delaware, the, uh, the, you know, the battles of the war, the political demarches um, of uh, you know, 1776 and the years afterwards. That was not the real American Revolution, John Adams said. The revolution happened from 1760 to 1775. It was a, what he called a change in the minds and hearts of the people. That's when the American people realized they were a people. 
They had a union. There was more that united them than divided them. And they realized the ideas of personal liberty and equality, of individual rights, uh, limited government, consent of the governed, all that complex of ideas came, became clearer and clearer in the process of that 15 years before the revolution. The revolution accomplished the change that had been underway in the minds of the people already. The kind of revolution that liberalism has been uh, making for a century, the kind of uh, revolution that progressivism has been up to, has been a change in the minds and hearts of the people, which they have been preparing for a very long time. And not just preparing, but they have been implementing piece by piece in the years uh, that I refer to. Let me just say something very briefly about these three waves, just to characterize them. The first wave of progressivism, Woodrow Wilson, Teddy Roosevelt even, Herbert Crowley, many other famous names, established the idea of the living constitution. You can see one of the brilliant strokes of the people at the Encounter Books was choosing the color scheme of this cover. <laughs> it's just the right Dante's Inferno <laughs> set, of, set of colors to describe 2020 and the world that 2020 has left us now <laughs> in 2021. Um, the living constitution you see on the cover there, that's the liberals' constitution. The living constitution, which is a phrase that comes from Woodrow Wilson, he defended as a Darwinian idea. And the living constitution implies that the old constitution is already dead, or at least that it is on life support, so drastically that the only, its only hope is to receive transfusions from the Constitution that is alive. And so for a very long time, for a generation or two, liberals held out the hope that they didn't need to make a revolution because there was going to be a kind of evolutionary convergence between these two constitutions over 50 or 60 years. That all changed um, in uh, the 1960s and in the 1990s. There were sort of two periods where acceleration became the rule. But that is the original, the living constitution is an idea that's been around parallel to the real constitution, the conservative constitution for um, a century. And it means to replace all of the checks and balances of the original constitution with ways of empowering government. It's, meant to replace limited government essentially with limitless government. With a government that can overcome the separation of powers, federalism, bicameralism, all of these things which were, for those of you who had to, you know, were forced to read the Federalist Papers in college at some point, all of these things which were the proudest boast of James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, all of these wonderful institutional devices like federalism and separation of powers, are exactly what the, the uh, progressives regarded as the outmoded parts of the Constitution that had to be uh, replaced to make it easier for people with, of course, good educations, good degrees, and only the best motives to be handed unlimited power to do good to and for Americans. The second bill of rights, the second wave, coincides with FDR, the New Deal, and what he called the Second Bill of Rights. You know, this is a famous phrase from his 1944 annual message. The Second Bill of Rights means welfare rights. It means the unofficial addition to our politics of all the rights which are now at the heart of it, or almost at the heart of it. I mean a right to health care, a right to a job, uh, a right to an education, a right to a vacation from the job, uh, uh, you know, all of these social and economic goods were added to our politics in the 1930s and 40s um, by the second wave of liberalism. By the way, none of these kind of social and economic rights were regarded as legitimate under the original Constitution. Um, that you could tax Peter for the sake of Paul, that you could actually take tax money from one individual and give it to another individual was regarded as absolutely immoral, a wicked scheme, to use Madison's term. Um, and 
that changed basically in the 1930s and 40s. And now, even to raise that thought is extremely subversive, and I think it qualifies as a macro aggression, not <laughs> a, a micro aggression. And finally, the, the third wave, the 60s, which is harder to understand because it's all over the place and it's partly Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society, and it's partly all of those SDSers and New Left people who hated Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society, but somehow they worked together, ultimately, in the transformation of American politics in, those, uh, in that decade. If, uh, if the second the Bill of Rights was about the addition of welfare rights, you could say that the third wave brings a third Bill of Rights to American politics, in which the right to your own lifestyle, to your own culture, to your own morality, is now added to the scheme of things. Um, these are the kinds of rights which we now call identity rights. They're rights to um, sexual satisfaction of whatever sort you may wish for. To sexual identification, you can be whatever you identify with. Um, and marriage and all sorts of other, the family, all sorts of other important social institutions must bend to meet the new imperatives of, of absolute sexual satisfaction for the, the autonomous individual, the willful individual. But it's not just that. It's worse. Because in addition to this, the liberating side of these new rights, you have this, the, the compulsory side. That the new rights must be recognized by others. It's not enough to just have the right to follow whatever morality you want to follow, to redefine marriage in any way you want to redefine it. It's that no one can have the right to, to uh, denounce that or to oppose that. That is hate speech. To denounce the new agenda of rights is not permitted. All is permitted except the denunciation of the things that are compulsory. And that is not permitted. Um, and as you may have heard from the campus, I report from the campus, you know, I do, I do teach students, Silence is violence, <laughs> to use one of these phrases that you unfortunately would hear a lot more of if there were any students on campus. <laughs> <laughs> not, not in California, I assure you. <laughs> but silence is violence means it's not enough not to condemn or not to criticize the new set of rights. You have to affirm it. You have to positively endorse it. If you don't, um, it's not enough to be against racism. You have to say you are against it, campaign against it. You must embrace the whole agenda, which is now called anti-racism. Martin Luther King would be a racist by today's definition of anti-racism, because he believed in a colorblind America. But colorblindness is now a mark of racism. I, I, I wish I were making this up. But this is the way not only campus politics is conducted, but unfortunately, mainstream American politics is increasingly um, conducted. So if you add all of that up, the changes of the three waves, and, and we're right in the middle in the way of a fourth wave, or perhaps it could best be understood as an extension, a completion of the third wave, you'll see what I'm talking about. This is not a different way of interpreting the Constitution. It's a different country that they're looking for. It's an alternative to the Constitution. It's a revolution against the Founders' Constitution as a whole. And they don't make, they don't hide this. This term, which now occurs everywhere, systemic, systemic racism, systemic sexism, um, systemic capitalism, it, it, I mean, we're now caught up in the racist part of this, of this uh, wave. But just two years ago, we were talking about the Me Too movement and you know, women's age finally coming and being realized. And two years before that, Bernie Sanders was bringing us glad tidings from the Soviet Union and Venezuela. 
and some of his other um, um, uh, tourist spots, that socialism, democratic socialism, was the way for the future. But it doesn't matter whether it's systemic capitalism or systemic sexism or systemic racism. The current position of the left is that something sh sure as hell is wrong with America that is systemic. It goes all the way down. In the language of the 1619 Project that uh, Roger mentioned, it's in our national DNA. Now, as you may know, you can't change your DNA. So this is a, you can't have a more, you know, systemic, you can't have a more fundamental objection to the whole idea of America than saying it is diseased from, from the get-go, in its own DNA. What can you do about that? Well, unfortunately, we, there's not much you can do about it except turn over power to the doctors that they recommend. I thought I'd end just by... Not on that note. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought I should end eventually. What do you think? I could go on. I am a professor, after all. Uh, but I, I thought that the, the stakes were really never better uh, identified than many years ago in 1964 by Ronald Reagan. Um, he told the story in the speech, this great you know, address of his for Barry Goldwater, this will take us back a while, to, in, in 1964. Uh, and he told this um, story in his speech, which I think is a, a, a good note to end on. He said, not too long ago, this was 1964, remember, two friends of mine, two American friends of mine, we're talking to a Cuban refugee. I thought this is an appropriate story for Southern Florida. <laughs> Whatever. A businessman, a businessman, a Cuban businessman who had escaped from Castro. And in the midst of his story, one of my friends turned to the other and said, we don't know how lucky we are. And the Cuban stopped and said, how lucky you are. I had some place to escape to. And Reagan said, and in that sentence, he told us the entire story. If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on earth. Ladies and gentlemen, that was true in 1964, and I'm afraid it's even truer today. Thank you. Charles Kessler. Right. Right. Well, the man who is currently identifying as Charles Kessler will sign it. But first, can you answer a few questions? Sure, absolutely. And I, I would just ask that you, we have someone with a microphone here. I just, I, I'll identify you, and then you can do it. But I just like to ask one question for you: Is that what happened to liberals? Right? Is it? Could you explain the difference between being a liberal and being a progressive? Because once upon a time, liberals looked like they like to have fun. <laughs> and they believe in free speech, <laughs> free love. Yes, right. Yeah. And it's just, uh -huh. it doesn't look like it's so more anymore. Right. So is there a difference between being a progressive and being a liberal, and to, you know, to kind of paraphrase a, a political slogan, if we're going to make America great again, do we have to make progressives liberal again? Yes. <laughs> and what constitution are they going to make? Well, um, that's, thank you, David. That's a good question. Um, look, if, uh, you could say that, uh, you know, in 1964, the free speech movement was born at Berkeley, uh, and it was an important part of the new left. But that impulse didn't last long, even in the 60s. Um, by 1965, it was really fading, and uh, by, you know, 1966, uh, 67, the, the, the SDS, the same people who sort of embraced that, 
were meeting with the Viet Cong um, because they were in favor of the victory of the Viet Cong in South Vietnam. Uh, they were not just against the draft, although they were, of course, very much against having to go serve um, in the Vietnam War, but they were for the triumph of a totalitarian power. And they, they, perfumed, they perfumed that with um, an elaborate sort of uh, moralistic um, uh, uh, you know, uh, odor and ceremonies, but the, the hard and fast of it was the libertarian moment of 60s liberalism did not last very long. They were you know, <coughs> trying to take over Columbia. They, had, they were armed uh, students marching on campus. Uh, at, at several universities, Cornell and Columbia at different points um, in those years. And so um, I, I think we could say whatever <clears throat> the old, even more old fashioned, the old left before the new left, which was patriotic, which had, which was pro-American, <clears throat> was, was run out of town in the 1960s by the new left. Um, and then what happened, uh, as I mentioned, in the 1990s was once, we, once the Cold War was won, once we had no significant external threat, um, the limits of liberalism were blown. And they, could, they radicalized in the 60s in opposition to the Vietnam War and in, in opposition to the Cold War. They radicalized again in the 1990s uh, because the, uh, the, uh, they weren't afraid of being called communists. Again, communism had been defeated. It looked as though um, you know, there was clear sailing for their agenda, and they became fascinated. And Roger wrote one of the seminal books about the tenured radicals, you know, the beginning of the real political correctness movements uh, on American campuses. Um, they thought they could now safely turn our college campuses into little East Berlins. Do we want, anybody have a question? Great job, Charles. Thank you. Um, simple question, but I guess complex. What's yeah. the What's the way out of this? Um, and this little context is not only have the campuses been taken over, but this movement, cancer culture, this little re-education is. Every company I know is instituting these sensitivity trainings and so on and so forth. So it's it's much broader than just colleges. It's almost you know pervasive everywhere. And of course, people are cowering and afraid to speak out for the social media backlash, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we work ourselves out of this? Um, well, <clears throat> as you say, the problem is much uh, deeper now in some ways than it was in the '60s. Um, because in the 60s, big business was not on the side of the radicals. And now, effectively, big business, the Fortune 500, is on the side of the radical agenda. They're on the side of the anti-racist crusade. They're, uh, all of the, there's nothing too trendy, basically, for them to endorse and to spend hundreds of millions, billions of dollars backing. There was nothing really quite like that um, in the 60s. And so it, it is a, it's a very, look, it's a very difficult question to answer. I think one thing that connects Reagan to Trump, and I, for that reason is very interesting, is I, they both saw that in the, at the deepest level, this was a fight to, um, about the future of American patriotism. Were you going to be able to teach children in the next generation that theirs was a good country, that it was a force for good in the world, that it stood on the basis of true uh, principles of human rights, human freedom, human equality, human justice? Or were you going to take what Reagan in his farewell address called um, a more ambivalent point of view? And Reagan in the farewell address, which is one of, <clears throat> you know, uh, least, one of his least studied addresses, um, uh, but in, so this would have been 1989, um, said that um, he grew up in a different America than the present day America. When he grew up, he said, and we're talking about, you know, before the New Deal, 
Um, when he grew up, you learn patriotism from your parents, um, on the streets, from popular culture, from the radio, from television. Um, you would pick it up from movies. Um, it was around you, it was everywhere. And he said, that's not true anymore. Now there's basically an adversary culture in Hollywood and in popular entertainment, and the, and the schools um, don't teach students patriotism. And, they, and, and parents, he said, young parents don't know what to teach their children about America. They don't think it's right to teach that America is good. And so they settle for some um, ambivalence, neither, neither good nor bad, but you know, somewhere in the middle account of it. And he, and he presented this as basically a regime crisis. America, as he knew it, didn't exist anymore. It wasn't being perpetuated. It was dying. It was dying in classrooms all across the country, in movie theaters, um, you know, on televisions all across the country. Uh, and his only advice in the farewell address was, we need to do, we need to turn this around. And that means beginning with what parents tell their students at the kitchen table. You know, you've got to, you've got to counter the miseducation they're getting from the popular culture and their own teachers. Um, and I think that proved to be uh, a, a, an impossible assignment. It just hasn't happened. Now, the good news is, however, that Americans are reading lots of books about the founding. They're reading lots of biographies of the founders and Lincoln and others. Um, there's you know, homeschooling, charter schools, new classical and Christian academies are expanding like never before. So we're fighting, we're in this fight. But it is a, it is a very long-term fight. But the 1776 Commission was in a way a direct link from the end of Trump's term to the end of Reagan's two terms. It was an attempt to push that ball forward. In both cases, in a way, it came too late to make much of a difference, truth be told. But the analysis is true. And if we, if we have conservative <coughs> candidates and parties that take this as a first order priority, because if you don't, if you don't rescue, as it were, the Constitution from the liberal Constitution, no public policy that is conservative will survive. You've got to change the, the fundamentals. Um, and that, is, and that has to be sort of from the very first day, from the inaugural address. It's got to be in the consciousness of the conservative parties, as I say, the, the president, Congress, and others. Um, and of course, we, you know, what to do about higher education is uh, the perennial the question. That, we can't talk about dark things. No, no, no. Which, we'll we'll uh, you know, I mean, Bill Buckley wrote God and Man at Yale. The very beginning of the modern American conservative movement, he drew attention to this issue in 1951. It's much worse, much, much worse now than it was in 1951. Maybe we need new, I mean, why is there only one Hillsdale College? Why aren't there 10 Hillsdale Colleges? Why aren't there, you know, conservative centers of resistance, especially in red states, in public universities where, you know, the trustees are appointed or otherwise accountable to the Republicans running the state? Um, why don't you move to Florida? <laughs> start one here. Well, I, I, I would like I would like to I think because I, I, I had a tear in my eye as Sally and I got off the plane into a free state. You know, we, we, we come from California, so uh, it was almost unbelievable. What was that? A bar that's open? <laughs> a little tear. You know, I, I had to wipe I had to wipe away. So believe me, we 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 feel um, that California is. That Florida is a big improvement on California, but Florida has problems. New Yorkers are coming down. Too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My friends are joining us. We have uh, one more question, please. Mr. Kendall, I have a question. Which, uh, 
microphone. Oh, I, just, I didn't realize that you were from California, and I also am from California. I'm a fourth generation San Franciscan, and um, a Berkeley grad, and so was my father and my brother. So um, my father was a United States Marine, and so I, I hear what you're saying, and I was connecting this Reagan story to the Trump story, and one of the things that I noticed in the last four years was that I understood what Trump was trying to say. But when I was a young girl, and um, Reagan was my first time I ever voted for president, I knew what President Reagan was saying. Mm -hmm. I could understand um, him referring to our American values, and I would be able to relate to that. And I felt that one of the things that were happening in the Trump administration was that he wasn't able to articulate things back to our founding fathers like Reagan did. We didn't learn from him about our history, and our kids didn't learn from I understood what Trump was saying, but I don't think it resonated in the way that Reagan was able to um, educate people when they were young. But I wanted to say this. I um, grew up, I was born in the 60s, and so I grew up in the three Keys and went to Berkeley. And even though, I, when I went to Berkeley, I knew that my professors were, were going to teach me things that were different than what my parents taught me, but my parents' position trumped that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but was um, being taught to me at the yeah. university. I, so it came in just as another sure. perspective. It didn't come in, I didn't arrive there without any foundation. And I just wanted to say, I raised my kids in the South, and I found that my kids are so strong in freedom, they understand the Constitution, they understand our values very well. I do think that we participate in that as a family, but I do think that in the Atlanta area, the schools that they went to, and the families that were surrounded, they were surrounded by, they, they learned those values and they continued with that. But I wanted to ask you, I feel like we need a new type of Reagan, and I wondered if you can look out onto the landscape, do you see any of our leaders that are able to um, dot, connect the dotted lines back to our founders and back to the real Constitution, and maybe not the living Constitution? Um. Yes, I, I mean I, there are there are some um, candidates on the horizon who I think are capable of that. I mean, you, maybe Florida's own governor um, is one of them. Um, and uh, you know, uh, Senator Tom Cotton, I think very high, highly of. He was a student of yours, but he was a student of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Bias. <laughs> So is David. You didn't say that. Cotton does seem to be able to, yes. when he articulates something, you hear him bring up our history. And right. you, you know, when I went, went to school, it's really interesting. I don't know if any of you have your um, grade school report cards, but if you look at the envelope from when you were in grade school, one of the missions of our school was to make, it says on my report card, to make a good American citizen. Right. And I'm pretty sure we could not say things like that I don't anymore. Yes. Well, um, I, I, I bring you good and bad news. Uh, I mean, the, the good news <clears throat> is that uh, people on the left are beginning to be interested in civics education. And the bad news is that people on the left are beginning to be interested in civics <laughs> education. Um, but they have a very different idea of what civics is. They, they, they believe, for example, in something they call active citizenship, which is teaching young people how to go out basically and join Black Lives Matter or participate in a protest to, you know, to, go, to, a, to go to a riot or a demonstration um, I mean, to be active in support of, you know, because silence is violence, as I quoted. Uh, a little bit earlier. But, you know, I, I, not, I, I certainly am not giving up on America. Um, Americans are an ordinary people. Um, they resist um, pressure, and they resist sort of being molded from the top down. Um, but they need to resist it more going, going forward. But there are some signs that that may be happening. Uh, so I'll give you one piece of optimism from California. All right, we had a, a huge election. The Democrats swept uh, all statewide offices. They, of course, Joe Biden won by more than 70%. Uh, 
of the very democratic, very liberal electorate in the state of California. But at the same time, on the ballot propositions of the initiatives and referenda, time after time, the hot button liberal issues, the things that they were set, had spent millions on and set their heart on, were defeated by the same liberal electorate that went for Joe Biden. So the repeal of Prop 209 was on the ballot. You know, Prop 209 from uh, um, uh, a generation ago forbid um, the UC, the, the public schools in California to hire or admit on the basis of race. It was an anti-racial discrimination um, initiative. Um, color, it was for color blindness, essentially, in education and public hiring and so forth. That very, you would have thought this was cutting edge anti-racism stuff, this was cutting edge um, multiculturalism stuff. It was defeated by more than 11 points in an electorate that elected Joe Biden by 30 some points. The same voters, something is going on. There is, uh, it's a complicated thing, and we can talk more about it when we have more time. But I would say that identity politics, this whole radical sort of third, third wave of the third, third wave agenda, is not as popular with citizens, you know, liberals, our fellow liberal citizens, as it is with the ideologues in the party. And there's beginning to be, you can beginning, you're beginning to see evidence in the voting behavior that there's some, some hope there for a common cause between the anti-PC, anti, um, um, you know, uh, multicultural um, uh, liberal voters, liberal citizens, and conservative citizens. Maybe we can crawl back to the Constitution as the common ground to oppose the latest and the worst of the liberal agenda. And if so, that's, I mean, that could be a, a very hopeful sign. Take a book, but I would also. Uh, Are we going to auction off the postcard? <laughs> <laughs> well, autograph, autograph the picture. We can have. But I would just kind of put out, I can kind of put before you how I started this is that, uh, you know, I think we are in a regime crisis. I think there's certain places that are thinking seriously about it. Um, I think in County Books, in the Claremont Review, and Charles Kessler, in particular as a scholar, are people who are thinking seriously about it. You know, while there is such thing as a as a, a free cocktail party or free lunch or you know, <laughs> thing like that, and even a free book, yeah. 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 I would just ask everyone here to kind of realize we all know freedom's not free. There are, there are people in places that are putting their money where their minds are and making a difference. And you know, Encounter and the CRV are, are, are two of such places. And I would just ask that to, that wrap your mind. And if you like what your mind sees, I mean, do what you can to help their uh, missions because they're very important. And with that, thank you. Did you mention that they were tax exempt? I'm not an economist, I'm sure that's your Thank you very much. Thank you.